What is it? It, it rhymes with a female body part. What is it? Mulva? <laughs> Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 unscripted moments on Seinfeld. I mean, we were having so much fun. I mean, we were whining, we were dining, we were dancing. <laughs> for this list, we'll be looking at the best accidental or improvised moments that ended up in the aired episodes of the sitcom. Were you surprised to learn about any of these unscripted moments? Let us know in the comments below. Number 20. George and Natalie on the phone. When George sees a communist newspaper called The Daily Worker at Elaine's apartment, he discovers a personal ad from a woman named Natalie who's looking for love. The best part? Appearance not important. This is unbelievable! <laughs> Finally, this is an ideology I can embrace! <laughs> when Natalie calls George while he's at work at Yankee Stadium, he does his best to persuade her that he's a devoted communist. It turns out that Jason Alexander improvised his side of the conversation for this scene. I'm, I'm here working for the people. Yes, I'm, uh, I'm uh, causing dissent, stirring the pot, getting people to question the whole rotten system. Unfortunately, we aren't able to see the other takes that didn't make the final cut. Apparently, whatever George said on the phone was convincing enough for his boss to think that he could go to Cuba to scout new players for the Yankees. Number 19. Kramer's Cafe Latte. For a character like Kramer, his eccentricities often shine through the most subtle actions. This was on full display when the show decided to put his own spin on the 1994 McDonald's coffee lawsuit. Kramer accidentally spills an entire cafe latte down his pants when he tries to sneak a cup into the movie theater. When he settles with the company for a lifetime supply of coffee, the whole ordeal leads to plenty of repetition of the name of this hot beverage. Listen closely to the weird way that Kramer stresses the syllables in Cafe Latte. He stopped off and bought this Cafe Latte. Mm -hmm. well, what is that, like Italian coffee? Yeah, that's right. Half milk, half coffee? Yeah. This was actually an improvisation by Michael Richards that turned out perfectly on brand for Kramer's offbeat character. Number 18. Kramer Speaks Italian. In one storyline, George's boss becomes obsessed with having calzones from Paisano's for lunch. After George gets banned from the pizzeria, he has no choice but to ask the crooked Kramer to buy the calzones for him. I need you to do me a favor. I need you to run down and get me lunch at Paisano's. No matter what happened to Newman. He called in sick. All right. Yeah, it's raining. This is predictably when things start to go south. Not only does Kramer ask to have his clothes heated up in the pizza oven, he also insists on paying for the food in loose change. As Kramer ends up in a shouting match with the owner of the pizzeria, Michael Richards launches into a rant in nonsensical, improvised Italian. It just goes to show that when you ask Kramer for a simple favor, something is bound to go wrong. Number 17. Smoking and Drinking Here's to feeling good all the time. When Jerry suspects that his accountant might have a bad habit, Kramer is enlisted to investigate. As he scopes out the accountant at a bar, he tries to play it cool by ordering a beer and lighting a cigarette. I'll have a Brutski, Charlie. <laughs> Name's Mitch. Yeah, there's nothing like a cold one after a long day, huh? Oh yeah, yeah I've been known to drink a beer or two. No one is prepared for what comes next. Michael Richards manages to chug his entire glass while smoking out of the corner of his mouth. On the first take of this scene, Richards does this on the spot but accidentally lets out a loud burp with a puff of smoke. <laughs> the audience's reaction led to a second successful take that made it into the final version of the episode. Number 16. Goodbye, Norman. During this complex two-part episode, Kramer and Newman devise a scheme to make a profit by collecting and depositing bottles. Boy, that completely changes our cost structure. Our G&A goes down 50%. We carry a couple of bags of mail and the rest is ours! Newman, you magnificent bastard! You did it! Let the collecting begin! <laughs> 
But while in pursuit of Jerry's stolen car, Kramer ditches Newman at the side of the freeway. The mailman is welcomed into a farmer's home and is warned to stay away from the daughter in the house. I just have one rule. Keep your hands off my daughter. <laughs> when Newman runs off after getting close with the daughter, the actress evidently forgets his name and accidentally shouts out, I love him! Goodbye, Norman! Goodbye. This funny error was embraced by the producers who opted to use that take rather than reshoot it. Number 15. Dolores. Jerry once started seeing a woman whose name he can't remember. What, you should have just asked her. I know I should have asked her. Well, what are you gonna do now? I don't know, I can't ask her now, I've already made out with her. All he was certain of was that it rhymed with a part of the female anatomy. During the live taping of the sitcom, the audience was asked to guess the name of Jerry's date. A woman shouted, Dolores. When Seinfeld heard about this, it was integrated into the scene on the spot. This was a welcome surprise because the writers had struggled to come up with a believable name for the girlfriend. In another taping with the original name, you can tell that Cloris doesn't get that big of a laugh. Cloris! Cloris! <laughs> Sometimes the best idea can come from a fan. Number 14. Poppy Ruins Jerry's Couch When Jerry gets a brand new couch, it doesn't take long for something unfortunate to happen to it. In this episode, Kramer's friend Poppy happens to take a seat on the sofa. I want you to sit down, Poppy. You're still recuperating. <sighs> Were you tired, Poppy? <laughs> no. Kramer happens to grab a water bottle out of the fridge just as the little accident Poppy left behind on the couch was seen. However, Jerry doesn't seem to notice his neighbor's beverage is open. So he gets a full face of water when he grabs and shakes Kramer by the shoulders. It is! Puppy peed on my sofa! Sure? Well, what is it then? The live audience erupts into laughter as Jerry continues the bit without missing a beat. We're glad these two seasoned actors held it together so that this version of the scene could end up in the episode. Number 13. The Air Conditioner the Parking Garage episode yielded several iconic moments for the series, one of the best centered on heavy appliances. While each of the gangs struggle in this race against time, Kramer's battle with the air conditioner is a feat of physical comedy. You sure you don't want me to help you with that? Although it wasn't specified in the script, Michael Richards insisted on carrying a real air conditioner throughout the shoot. In a blooper, Kramer accidentally slips and hits his face on the edge of the box as he drops it into the trunk of the car. What? Man! You can see Julia Louis-Dreyfus turning her head to hide her laughter as Richards does his best to save the take by staying in character. Number 12. Elaine's Dance This iconic performance of physical comedy simply could not be communicated on paper. Elaine's head-shaking dance moves never fail to make us smile. <laughs> Since Full Body Dry Heave, set to music, was not specified in the script, Julia Louis-Dreyfus had to come up with her own interpretation of the dance. According to the actress, she practiced a few awkward moves in front of the mirror before showing her mother and husband. I tried to look as spastic as possible while remaining confident in the face. I think that was the key, is to look as if I knew what I was doing. They helped her settle on the little kicks we know so well. The scene even had to be shot without music because it was too tempting for Louis Dreyfus to dance along to the rhythm. Number 11. Kramer's Slide From his harebrained schemes to his love for fresh fruit, there's so much to love about Kramer's quirkier habits. However, you might be surprised to hear that his iconic entrance into Jerry's apartment started out as an improvisation. Jerry, I think I'm on to something. I think I found your stuff. Michael Richards almost missed the cue to enter the apartment in the third episode of the show, so he accidentally slipped when he opened the door in a rush. When he noticed that it was well received by the audience, he decided to continue doing it. Hey. <laughs> Ever since, viewers have looked forward to Kramer's appearances in Jerry's apartment. Number 10, Nitrous Oxide. Well, you're looking sharp there, Tim. Yeah, well. 
I do what I can. Before Malcolm in the Middle and Breaking Bad, Brian Cranston had a role on this sitcom as the eccentric dentist Tim Watley. In the episode, The Jimmy, Jerry is visibly alarmed when Dr. Watley takes a huff of nitrous oxide before putting him to sleep. Cheryl, would you ready the nitrous oxide, please? In a recent interview, Cranston told the story of how this hilarious and terrifying move was actually an improvised idea. It'd be funny if you first took a hit of the laughing gas before you gave it to him. <laughs> and I thought, my God, that is funny. The actor decided to throw it into a take after hearing a suggestion from a crew member on the show. It just goes to show that if something unscripted is funny enough to impress showrunners Larry David and Jerry Seinfeld, it's bound to make it into the final cut. Yeah, that's funny. That's funny. That's good. That's funny. Good. Funny. Good. Yes. Good and funny. Yeah. Number nine, and they're spectacular. The gang's shallow obsessions usually get them into trouble. Sometimes when I think you're the shallowest man I've ever met, you somehow manage to drain a little more out of the pool. <laughs> this fact is doubly true when it comes to their romantic interests. In one episode, Terry Hatcher guest stars as Sidra, who dates Jerry after meeting him at their health club. Elaine convinces him that Sidra has implants, which leads to some impolite and inappropriate comments. Well, then that's it. That's the end of that. What? Just because of that? Just because of that? It's like finding out Mickey Mantle corked his bat. Oh. <laughs> this built up to a big argument with an extremely memorable ending. So, where were we? I was just leaving. Right, you were leaving. <laughs> According to Hatcher, Larry David would often give lines to the actors off the top of his head before they appeared in front of a live studio audience. When Sidra finally dumps Jerry, she reopens his door to deliver one iconic and impromptu line. And by the way, they're real oh. and they're spectacular. <laughs> Number eight, we'll go watch. Usually the end of a scene is the best time to throw in an extra line and hope for a laugh. All right, let's go. All right. Yep, yep, yep. him. You know, a lot of people have asked that. In this episode, Elaine visits an ex-boyfriend who's in the hospital for a splenectomy. This ultimately leads to the famous junior mint accident in the operating room. I don't want any. Just take one. No, stop. Kramer, stop it. <laughs> But before the operation, Kramer has to convince a reluctant Jerry to come watch the surgery. Seinfeld finally relents and confirms he's going with the crude confirmation while he has a mouthful of food. All right, all right. Just let me finish my coffee. I'm going to watch him go slice this fat bastard up. We initially thought this hesitation before the line was scripted. In reality, Jerry's final line was improvised during rehearsal and added in to put a great button on the scene. We were really out of the barn at that point, and we were now we were really running wild uh, across the prairie. Number seven, scratches. How about this? You put your car in the good spot. That'll hold the good spot in front of the good building, and we can get the good car. Good thinking. In this episode, George illegally parks in a spot for people with physical disabilities. This results in an angry mob surrounding his car while he makes a quick escape. When the gang returns to find George's vehicle has been wrecked, Seinfeld breaks the silence. You know, a lot of these scratches will buff right out. <laughs> his attempt to lighten the mood was surprisingly a spur-of-the-moment choice. A behind-the-scenes interview revealed that there were no lines scripted for the moment they saw the car. We're looking at this totally destroyed machine, and we don't have a line for that moment. Seinfeld was extremely satisfied that the right joke came to him when he needed it. That is probably the most exciting moment for me, when you can come up with a line and someone goes, that's good, that'll work. Number six, the IV pole. George's pettiness really knows no bounds. I gotta stay one step ahead of Neil. <laughs> What if it's Neil Armstrong? <laughs> then I'm going to Mars. <laughs> In the later seasons of Seinfeld, Jason Alexander often found ways to express the character's spiteful nature without saying a single word. George demonstrated this perfectly in the English Patient episode. He's dismayed when his new love interest decides against moving in with him and chooses to stay with her hospitalized boyfriend instead. The rival is all too happy to rub this fact in George's face. George. I win. As he silently exits the room, Alexander took the chance to add an unscripted action and disconnect the man's IV line. <laughs>
This impromptu tug perfectly sums up how hilarious and terrible George can be. Marry me. I'll burn myself. I'll burn my parents. Number five. You want a Christmas card? When Elaine decides to let Kramer take her photo for her Christmas cards, something was bound to go wrong. Oh, look at what we have here. A Christmas card from Laney. She sends them out to everyone she knows without realizing that a Miss Button shirt gave the recipients a little more than they bargained for. I sent this card to hundreds of people. <laughs> my parents, my boss, <gasps> Min and Papa. Instead of sympathizing with Elaine, George complains about how he didn't receive a card. She then grabs his head and takes her frustration out on him. You want a Christmas card? You want a Christmas card? All right, here. Here's your Christmas card. <laughs> According to Julia Louis-Dreyfus, the move was invented before anything was filmed in front of a live studio audience. I grabbed his head and I rubbed his head in between my boobs and threw him back. And that was something that we came up with in rehearsal. The crowd's reaction goes to show that this was a perfect addition to the scene. Number four, the latex salesman. Let's see, there's uh, <clears throat> Vandalay Industries. I uh, just saw them. I got very close there, very close. And what type of company is that? Latex, latex manufacturing. So. George's elaborate lies get him into trouble in the Boyfriend episode. He decides to use Jerry's phone number as the contact for a fake latex company. So well, now, when the phone rings, you have to answer, Vandalay Industries. I'm Vandalay Industries. Right. What is that? You're in latex. Unfortunately, Kramer picks up the phone and immediately starts ruining the scheme. What delay industries? No. Vandalay! Say Vandalay! No. Now you're way, way, way off. Although George runs from the bathroom in a desperate attempt to stop him, it's too late. While this hilarious exit was scripted, Jerry's final response wasn't. Upon finding George on the floor, the comedian says, And you want to be my latex sale. <laughs> Just when you thought nothing could be funnier than seeing George run around with his pants around his ankles, Jerry stole the show. And yeah, I mean, I, I got a great laugh out of it, but the capper was unbelievable. And he just, you know, <laughs> he just threw it in. Number three, Tic Tacs. Tell you this stuff, I am never doing that again. What, you mean in your mother's house or all together? All together. Oh, like, oh, oh give me yeah. A break. yeah. During this beloved episode about the gang's willpower, everyone is thoroughly challenged to remain masters of their domain. When George visits his mother in the hospital, he becomes distracted by an attractive patient receiving a sponge bath behind the curtain. What is it you're doing exactly? <laughs> George, your cousin Shelly is talking to you. <laughs> This makes him completely downplay his mother Estelle's complaints about the food. In one unscripted and perfectly timed toss, George offers a box of Tic Tacs as he continues to ignore her. Here, here, have some Tic Tacs. This was actually Estelle Harris's first appearance as George's mother. So the actress understandably got the giggles after Jason Alexander improvised this little action in the first attempt at this take. I couldn't stop giggling for about 20 minutes. I went, oh, I love this one. This is, this is gold. Just gold. Number two, stalling. Where's the car? Well, I, I thought it was here. You don't know where we parked? <laughs> we weren't expecting so much hilarity from a story where the gang gets hopelessly lost in the parking garage of a New Jersey mall and can't find their car. The complex stage set and the long hours of filming meant that a lot was riding on this episode to succeed. When I wrote The Parking Garage, I really didn't think about the, the execution. Luckily, the perfect ending to this adventure occurred completely by chance. In the original script, the gang is supposed to drive away after they finally find their car. And that was going to be the end of the show, and there was some dialogue in the car, and, and then uh, they would pull out and, and leave. When Michael Richards gets into the driver's seat, the vehicle stalls when he attempts to start it. The other actors can even be seen laughing uncontrollably in the car. You'll see the heads bobbing up and down. Their real reactions made for an accidental ending that was just too good to omit from the episode. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications.
Number one, Elaine's shove. Who would have guessed that one of Elaine's classic moves was originally unscripted? <laughs> According to an old college classmate, the big push was something that Julia Louis-Dreyfus actually did in real life. The first time the actress pulled this move in the sitcom was in the episode The Apartment. You remember Mrs. Hud Walker, the 94-year-old woman who lived above me? No. She died? She died? She died. She died. <laughs> when Jerry finds Elaine a cheap rental in his building, she expresses her excitement with her iconic shove. Get out! It prompted such a great reaction from the audience that it became a staple of her personality. It's impossible to think of Elaine without picturing the shove now. Get out! <laughs> this aggressive move is the perfect expression of her passion and impulsiveness. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from Watch Mojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. Mm -hmm.